Welcome all of you uh, to this fairly warm venue. I'll try to deliver a bit of cool content to balance it out for you. Um, if you read the description for my talk, I don't know if you're here to learn how to hack your employer or if you're here to try to make them more, more secure. But for both of you, I think you'll have some takeaways from this. So welcome. This is for the slides. There will be an additional one on the last uh, slide if you didn't catch this one yet. So DevOps, I'm, since you're here, I guess pretty much all of you are using Azure DevOps or something similar. Um, and so it's a no-brainer today. That's what pretty much all the successful teams use. And, but if you look back at how it all started, at least it was this way for me, that this was something that you found out about. OK, these other cool guys are using this. Shouldn't we try it out? You do a proof of concept. You think, oh, this is awesome. We don't have to build. We don't have to test manually anymore. And you start using it for everything. You start using it for your production deploys. And suddenly, you went very quickly from proof of concept up to that level. <coughs> did you really look at all of the security settings inside your DevOps environment when you did this step? Did you evaluate the risks of all the secrets that you're putting in there? I think in most cases, uh, this will be a firm no. So let's look through that together. I'm Bjorn Wierström. I work at Uppsala Monitoring Center in Sweden as a lead developer. And I have an open source project uh, called Cypress NTLM Auth. That's Cypress is an end-to-end -end testing tool. So this plugin adds Windows authentication support for it. And you can reach out to me afterwards if you want to through these links. Uh, this is the layout. We'll first talk a bit about how DevOps is structured and where the three secrets may be stored. Then we'll look at two different techniques of how to, you can expose them. Uh, we'll also look at how to expose content from repositories. Uh, when we learn all of that, we might want to learn something about how to keep secrets away from Azure DevOps so it isn't vulnerable for these techniques. And I will close up with some hidden gems, features that I found really useful in Azure DevOps that I think aren't really well known. Uh, so if you look at the hierarchy, you have the top level, that's just the system. And then we have your organization. And underneath your organization, you have your project. Underneath your project, you have this. This is where you work. You have your boards, you have your repositories, and everything. But are you using more than one project or not? If you look at the recommendations in the docs from Microsoft, they say that just use one. And it can make sense, because it's less maintenance that way, and it's easier to move things around within a project than crossing between project boundaries. But if you have more strict uh, needs for separation between different teams, between, the, between different departments, then probably you will be setting up multiple projects. And inside your projects, what are the secrets? Yeah, of course, everyone knows about the passwords. We could have certificates, it could be access tokens, or what have you. Where are the secrets? Number one. This is where I used to find a lot of them in the past. Uh, it could be hard-coded into the source code. It could be in the app settings files, web config file, or other certificates checked in with the code or in a wiki, uh, or even in the pipeline definitions. I did a search on GitHub uh, for the phrase password inside app settings, and you get quite a lot of hits on that. Um, I guess all of them aren't real production code. Most of this is just uh, testing things. But either way, uh, even if you think this is old news, I will keep telling this story all the time until the junior developers that I encounter don't do this mistake anymore. Because it's, it's so important. You have excellent tooling inside Visual Studio where you can use a feature called user secrets, where you put your secrets so you don't even have to have them for your local testing environment. And Apart, uh, away from that, when you go into your CI, develop, uh, <coughs> CI environment, parameterize everything so you don't have to hard code it. And if we don't store them there, where are they then? We have a concept called variable groups inside Azure DevOps and secure files. They might also be in Azure Key Vault if you're, using, if you're more leaning onto that. 
we have now two different types of pipelines within Azure. You have the YAML pipelines and you have the classical pipelines, right? And there could be variables with secrets within them defined within classical pipelines. Or you could store it locally directly on the server that's not touched by the CI itself. We will focus mostly on these aspects in this talk. And if you haven't used a variable group before, this is where you find it. So you go to your pipelines, you go to the library, and there you go. Let's look at what a variable group are for. It's just what it's called like. You, you can set up a set of variables there, and they might be non-secrets or they might be secrets. And it's an excellent way to share configuration between your build or different environments. Like a microservice URL, you only have to update it in one singular place. And it allows you to structure your variables for each environment. At least that's what I like to do. So I have a group for system test, I have one for staging, and I have another one for production. And if you open a variable group, it will look something like this. Uh, when you create a new variable, it will by default be a non-secret, but you can make it into a secret by clicking on this padlock. And when you do that, the value becomes masked. You cannot copy it anymore. You cannot clone the variable group and try to extract it that way. And if we try to remove the lock again, uh, even with the Alahomora spell, it still won't show. It will be cleared when we do that. You can even try to use the REST API to catch it, but it doesn't work either. So from a UI perspective, it's pretty solid. But let's try to extract it. So in all of these scenarios, we are assuming that we have a user who has access to your DevOps environment. So this either someone who's already working at the company or someone who has acquired them in some other way. In this case, the user knows about the variable group, variable group that has a production secret that he's curious about. So what can you do to find it? Well, you create a new pipeline, you include the target variable group that we're interested in, and you try to expose the secret from there. Now, maybe you've already tried this and know what will happen. So here is our simple pipeline. We connect it to this specific group, and we add a script line where we try to echo the content of this connection string secret that we saw before. So what will happen here? Well, nothing fancy, because Azure DevOps will catch this and mask it also in the logs. So I think they did at least a decent effort here. But if we take now one step back and think about how did they actually go about to implement this masking technology? What would you have done in this case? Let's look at the pipeline again. This is something rather straightforward. Here we're just printing it directly in the script. I might have done something much more elaborate, storing it in a variable and passing it around between functions or wherever before I try to print it. Do we really think that Microsoft went the whole length and tried to parse everything I'm doing here to know exactly where my secret is when I try to print it? I don't think so, and I don't think any of the other CI environments do that either because it's just too complicated. So what would they do instead? likely. Hmm, I think they do a search and replace. If that's the case, how, how could we get around that? Well, one rather cumbersome way would be try to logging a dictionary with like password phrases and find which one is masked. Maybe a bit more convenient would be to encode the secret as hex before we log it change the casing, or even simpler, substrings. So let's try substrings. Same pipeline, small change. I assign the secret to a local variable, and this is shorthand for extracting the first character of that variable, add a space, and then the rest of it. What do you think will happen? Great success. So I think this is a really good example because it shows just how easy it is. I mean, a lot of hacks that you come across are fairly convoluted. This is really easy to do. And I think 
you probably could manage to sneak in an additional line in a script somewhere in your pipelines, even if it's reviewed, to accomplish this, right? But let's say we don't want to go that way. We don't want to echo it out into the log. Someone might be, get suspicious and see it sometime. Let's do it in another way. Same pipeline, but here, instead of putting this in a variable, I uh, append it to a file called secrets text. And then I add another step to publish it. And I publish it in an artifact that no one will probably open ever. Uh, and let's look at that. We got our artifact. When we open it, we have our secrets file. And then we have it again in plain text. Now, maybe this is at first astonishing, but if you think back, of course the pipeline has to have raw access to these things. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to create our app settings file or what have you that it needs to do. It wouldn't be able to communicate with your database or your servers. So, of course, it has to have this raw access. But I think still maybe we aren't aware of how easily accessible it is, even though we have a masking feature. So what can we do to kind of prevent this? Well, we can look at how uh, these variable groups are accessed. We can limit the resource access. Because there are settings for which variable groups may be accessed by a pipeline. There's also settings for which users may authorize such access. So let's look at those. These are the different access levels that exist for variable groups and secure files. Uh, the read level is the base level where you can just list which variables exist and apply them in a pipeline if they're already approved. The user level means that we're allowed to authorize the use of the variable group or secure file in a pipeline. That's the important one. Then comes when you have ACL access so you can change who has these roles. But you can note that none of the access levels, not even the administrator, has read level access for secrets. Resource authorization is a process that a pipeline goes through when you run it the first time or when you change uh, which resources it accesses. So any user that has a user plus access level on that resource will be able to authorize it. It looks kind of like this. So I've created here a new pipeline. It will tell you that this pipeline needs permissions to access resources before the run can continue. Click the, click the view button, we will see which resources it is, access, uh, it, it is requiring access for. And now our user doesn't have the proper permission level to authorize it, so there's no button to approve it. They have to go to another developer or someone in the DevOps team who has that authority to approve it. Okay? Sounds like this might solve the problem, right? Uh, but there's another step. And this is in the variable group settings themselves, you have something called pipeline permissions. So you can predefine that a variable group should be accessible to a set of pipelines. And the, the sad part of the story is that the default setting for this when DevOps was young and new was that it was unrestricted. So all, all pipelines may access the variable group. Then sometime in May 2020, Microsoft changed this. So when you create a new variable group after that date, then it will be restricted by default. But all your old variable groups that you had defined in the past will still be unrestricted. So here it doesn't matter uh, with this authorization. They will be automatically authorized since any pipeline can access them. So if we click Restrict Permissions, we will get to this page, uh, which shows which uh, pipelines are allowed to access that particular variable group. And you can add them here up front, so you don't have to go through uh, the nuisance of approving all of them when you run them the next time. But really, recommendation, go through your variable groups and enable this, unless your variable group doesn't contain any secrets. You might have one that's just which node version should we use, which .NET version should we use, just plain text values, then you're fine. Don't worry. Last trick with this, the classical pipelines can still use the resource. Doesn't matter that it's restricted, doesn't matter with the authorization flow, all the classical pipelines will still have full access to whichever variable group they want. So 
disable them and migrate away from them if, if you want to be a bit more safe. Uh, secure files, maybe you aren't using them, but the same settings applies, just as we showed here. Uh, it's just that in that case, I can't really see a use case where you want to have them unrestricted because the secure files are by name something that is a secret, right? So they should always be restricted. Mm -hmm. Now we learned how to try to stop this. Let's see how efficient that is. In this case, our user does not have the access to approve the use of the variable group that they're interested in. Okay, so we just took care of that. How would you approach it this time? Well, instead of creating a new pipeline or adding the variable group to a pipeline, the user instead tries to find an existing pipeline that already has the target variable group because then it's already authorized, right? And then uh, we can make a branch and modify that pipeline. We push it up and expose the variable. This is our starting point. Uh, this is a deployment pack pipeline that has access to this group read access uh, with just a single script statement. We branch it and modify it and add our substring trick here at the bottom. And then we push this and we should be able to see the secret. Uh, not so fast. Maybe, just maybe, uh, there were some policies in place for this branch meaning that this won't auto-build because the master branch is protected. I can't just push, uh, or pushing expose won't build it, and getting it into the master would require a reviewed PR, so I, I would have some additional steps and risks if I really want to go through with this. You have any idea what we would do? Would we go to a developer and try, try to ask them to approve this? Or we can change the trigger. We have control of the pipeline. We can change it. It doesn't have to be master anymore. We just change it to our own branch. And now when we push this, it will build directly and expose the secret. All right, so if we're going to be thorough here, we have to find some way then to also prevent pipeline modification, as we just saw. There are security settings in the pipelines, which we can use. But when I try that out, it appears that they only affect when you're trying to do things to the pipelines from the UI. So everything that you're doing in the YAML file directly in your local repo won't matter whatever security settings you set up or which users are there. So that one's out. You could limit which users have access to which repositories. I don't really like this approach that much. I believe in transparency and that we should be able to learn as easily as possible from each other between teams. Uh, but it's a possibility. We could use the classic pipelines, but we didn't really want to use the classic pipeline, so let's just skip that. Uh, this is getting a bit more interesting. It's possible to add checks and constraints on a variable group, meaning that it will only be accessible under certain conditions. It could be a manual authorization step whenever you use a production variable group, for instance, or we could limit it to a specific branch, like the master branch. In that case, the last scenario would not have been possible. So that might be doable, but if we're gonna limit it to a specific branch, I would say this might work for production. But our test environments, I like to be able to release a lot of different branches, feature branches, what have you, and try them out. And therefore, it's much more difficult to limit what names of branches are allowed to push to that or to use those, uh, those variable groups. Maybe you don't think it's so critical if we expose a few uh, test environment secrets, but try harder. <laughs> it's, it's really good if you can secure those up too. Uh, I don't want to mention how many companies I worked with where those are the same in those two environments. So, uh, and then you can use Azure Key Vault, but it's pretty much the same thing because the secrets will still pass through our pipeline. They will be linked to a variable group and they will pass through the pipeline. So you might uh, set checks and constraints on 
your service connection to Azure Key Vault to try to restrict that at only specific branches is allowed. All right, so there's not really a silver bullet in there. Uh, it's, it's difficult to prevent pipeline modification completely. So uh, what can I tell you? Uh, we will have some other aspects of this where we try to remove secrets from Azure DevOps instead later on. But let's first look at the repository. We've only looked at the variable group so far. In this case, our user doesn't have access to the target repository. But they're very curious about what's inside. Okay? What can they do? They create a new pipeline. They clone the target repository manually. They don't link the pipeline to the repository, but they do a git clone command inside the pipeline. Then they can list the files, and they can expose content of a file. This is how this would look. Uh, we clone the repository Conan, which we know exists and are interested in, but we don't have access to it. And we enter the directory of Conan. We can list the contents. We run it. We see which con what contents exists. And then on the second pass, we can add statements to output all the contents of a file, which we are in particularly interested in. We might just have, as well just pack this up into an artifact and download the whole repository if, we, if that's what we wanted. So, I mean, everything from that repository is available to us despite the fact that we don't have access. Why? Ah, okay. Short demonstration of this technique. But why was this possible? Because the pipeline is not run by you. It's run by the build agent. And the build agent user is the master ring. With the default setting, the build agent user has access to all the projects in the whole organization. Everything. Okay, I'll say that again. All the projects, all the repositories in the whole organization. We're just lucky that it doesn't include contributor access, because then we could have done all the other tricks for the variable groups by changing pipeline files in whichever repository we wanted. So the build agent can't, by default, modify that. But I've seen cases where we've added this specific access to specific repositories. It might be OK if you have like a release notes repository or something like that, where you're only pushing those kind of data into it and doesn't contain anything secret at all. But otherwise, be really restrictive with adding this access level to the build agent user. But we, there must be something we can do about this. Yes, there is. On project and also on organizational level, there are few settings that we should enable called job authorization scope settings. So the first two are related to inter-project access. And this non-release pipeline and release pipeline stuff, you can, if you aren't using the classical ones, you can ignore it. Uh, everything is actually in this category, but doesn't matter. Just enable both of them. When you do that, the build agent won't be able to access across projects, at least. It can still access any repository within your project. OK, if we enable the third one, then Azure DevOps will limit the access level of your build agent to only the repositories that are used by your pipeline. So this means that if you have to access multiple repositories from your build, then you have to list them up as resources at the very beginning of your pipeline. So Azure DevOps is aware that you're going to use them. It can allow you to authorize that access, and then, it's, then it will work. Now, for some reason, these were all disabled by default. Um, I strongly recommend you to enable it. Uh, Microsoft made a change here again, May 2020, where they set, made this default enabled, but only for new clients. So, yeah. Look through your settings, and I, I recommend putting it at the organization level, as I said, because that will override any project setting changes. Okay. Now, 
we're all scared of how easy it is to extract stuff from anywhere. Uh, but is there something that we could do like more long term to solve this? Let's see what we can do in keeping the secrets away. Managed identity is something that I really like. Only main drawback is that you have to be like, completely in Azure. You cannot do it for on-premise resources. It has to be hosted and authenticated through an Azure ID, AD. But if you have that in place, this eliminates the need completely for us developers to handle the authentication information. Everything is resolved internally in Azure. And we don't need to extract it for any, any means. Uh, it's all there locally. And it rotates it for us to keep it secure. So there's no secrets left to expose. If we're not that lucky, maybe we could use something like Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault is just one example of a secret store which is independent of DevOps. Uh, I mean, the path that we discussed earlier was linking this to Azure DevOps, and then this doesn't help at all. It, it helps a little bit because it has version control, which we don't have in the variable group, so I think it's, it's still a good product. But you can design your services to integrate directly with Key Vault and fetch your secrets. This is what we do in our organization. So whenever you have an app recycle in the startup phase, it will connect to Key Vault and it will fetch the secrets it needs and then run. So there's nothing in the app uh, settings for it. It's automatically populated. So I really like that feature. There's a couple of uh, limitations to it. Um, one is you have to have network access to Azure Key Vault from your servers. If they're tightly firewalled somewhere or air gapped, I, I don't know, then this is not a possibility. But as long as you can allow access at least up to the Azure, the Azure environment to access, to access your key vault, you can use it. The other potential drawback that I've seen is that our new .NET APIs, they have a tendency of getting stuck in a limbo state when they encounter an exception during the startup. And one such exception which we've seen now and then, is that it cannot connect to Azure Key Vault. Because of some temporary network disturbance, maybe that link is down for a minute or two, but if we're unlucky that our application pool is recycling at exactly that time, it tries to start, it tries to connect to Azure Key Vault, it throws an exception and gives up, but it doesn't shut down. So it keeps running and serves this 503.20 or whatever uh, to everyone who's interested until it recycles again. So something to be aware of. OK. Let's go another way. Let's talk about some hidden gems, uh, which I think uh, deserve a bit more attention uh, that are really good to have in your toolbox uh, for your pipelines. Now, how many times? Have you dreamt that you could just repeat a task in your build or your deploy pipeline? That single task that just fails intermittently and it's kind of out of your hands? This happened to me many times that I was, I was looking for this kind of feature, but it just wasn't there. Until I found it by chance uh, just a few weeks ago. It's actually been there for about a year, but I don't think that there I mean, there, there's so many changes in Azure DevOps, so you can't really push news about everything to anyone. I understand that. But this was a really, really great addition. So you can add an additional argument, retry count on task failure. Maybe not the best name, but it tells you what it does. And then you set a number. So if this task fails, it will retry it up to this number of times before it fails the complete job. You will get a warning if it failed one or more times, uh, but that's just good. I, I like to see uh, what happens. But it's so much more convenient. The alternative that we had considered was working out some kind of PowerShell script where you're trying to do a repeat cycle yourself. If you're doing it that way, you lose all the convenience of all the built-in tasks that are already in, available for you in Azure DevOps because you can't use them that way, right? So I really, really like this. A couple of tasks which we have particularly many issues with were NuGet tasks that tend to fail our builds now and then, and also an IIS management tasks which tend to fail our deploys now and then. So.
get shallow, repositories can get pretty large over time. And uh, when we do a git clone, which is what regularly happens when, it's, when we run our build pipeline, it will fetch the full repository and all the history by default, right? We might have in the past committed some large files by mistake, some testing data, wherever we removed it and we're good, but it's still there, it's in the history. So in most scenarios, your build pipeline don't really care about that history. It only cares about the most recent version of your code. And there's an additional parameter that you can add to your git clone command, dash dash depth equals one, and that limits your fetch to only the most recent version. When we apply this in our project, we cut 30 seconds on our build pipeline runtime. So I think it's significant, and, but it's really well hidden away. You have to edit your pipeline, you have to click the three dots, more actions, go to triggers, then select YAML, then get sources. So this is when you, you are in edit pipeline, you selected more actions, you selected triggers. That would land you on that tab. You change to the YAML tab, you select get sources, and down here is what we're looking for. So we enable shallow fetch and we can set an, uh, a custom depth there. I mean, there might be cases where you want to do some tricks in your deploy uh, where you need additional depths, but usually one should be enough. This is also something that Microsoft has, just, has enabled by default sometime in the fall last year, uh, but not for all your old pipelines. So you can go in and enable it on all your old pipelines and make them faster. Okay, environment resources, last tip a way to simplify on-prem deployment. Has any of you used environment resources? No. Have you used environments? Yes, okay. It was the same for me. So environment, that was a way for us to like add a mutex to our, all our deployments. We defined an environment called system test and we required it to be allocated for our deploy and this way no other deploys could run against the same environment at the same time. I think that's usually what you use it for. But slightly hidden inside environment is another tab called resources where you can add resources. And I started playing around with that and found that this, this was really useful. Because what you do there is that you register all your servers that you use in your environment, or at least the servers that you deploy to. And you do this by installing an deployment agent on each server. So when you do that, they self-register with Azure. And this way, Azure DevOps is aware of that those servers exist and it can deploy directly to them. So directly from Azure DevOps into the servers. This provided a lot of nice benefits. We got native PowerShell. We don't need to do remote sessions anymore. We can just run it as it is. This gave us much better logging so we see what's going on and it reduced the runtime by like 30 to 80% because these remote sessions are terribly slow. And we didn't need an on-prem deployment server anymore because everything could go directly to the target servers. And when we don't need an on-prem deployment server, we don't need a super user account. This is another way of cutting down on your secrets because this deployment server would have to have access to specific accounts which were authorized to do a lot of things on all our production servers, right? But this way, everything goes in the other direction. It's the servers themselves that talk to DevOps and ask, okay, do you have any tasks for me? All right, let's do that. So they don't need any specific user accounts to do that. And all our servers suddenly became reachable. We had issues with deploying to our servers which were located in the DM set, but now they communicate by themselves with Azure DevOps. You structure your deployment jobs by using tags. So when you create, or you, when you set up a server this way, you also specify which tags it has. So if it's a web server, database server, or whatever kind of distinctions you need, 
And then in your pipeline, you reference those tags. So I say, run a deployment job on this environment with these tags. And then it will run it on all the servers that has those tags. If you skip the tags, it will run it on all the servers. OK, the, the only thing that I was really hesitant about at the start was, do we really want to have a deployment agent running on our production server? Because that was like the only bigger change from the server's perspective. It has a very reasonable footprint. It, has about, it uses about 50 megabytes of RAM when it's running and it's idling. When it's deploying, it doesn't really matter because it's shutting down the services anyway. But I mean, it's, it's not really competing a lot with the rest of the resources on the, on the server. So I don't really see that as an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. So we talked a lot about security settings, and that makes you kind of sleepy. But it's, the, it's a, a classical trap that you set up a lot of bureaucracy and authorization flows, and you make it really hard for your developers to actually do their job. So I think it's still really important that we trust our developers uh, and let them uh, work in an efficient manner. Otherwise, we just risk that they go to talks like mine and try to get the secrets themselves so they can work efficiently, right? So trust your developers and minimize the need for handling the secrets. So push as many of them away from, uh, from both Azure DevOps and from your local environment so you don't need to handle them manually. Some takeaways. In the short term, we talked about the variable groups and the secure files. Restrict the pipeline access. That's not enabled by default in your old installations. And restrictive use of user access level or above. So you have some control over who can authorize it for new pipelines. And disable classic pipelines. When you disable classic pipelines, it doesn't mean that they all disappear. It just means that you can't create any new ones. So you still have time to migrate away from the ones that you need to use. Uh, for the repositories, manage user access and limit the job authorization scope so you cannot cross-reference stuff uh, at, your, at your ease. And in the long term, get the secrets out of there. Put them in Azure Key Vault and use the server fetch technique. Use the environment resources to get rid of the super user accounts in your deploys. Or go to manage identity when you're finally in Azure completely. Thanks so much for your attention. Um, it's been really nice to do this talk live uh, because I've done quite a few talks during the pandemic. Uh, so it's great to have an audience again. You can find the slides there. There's a, the actual link at the top if you cannot manage to scan it. Um, there were, were actually some other sessions if you're really interested in this topic. I would recommend to take a look at Michael Kaufman's session on GitHub Advanced Security, which was uh, held on the first day, and also Kyle Kotovich's session about no password. Uh, both of those are really connected, I would say, to this. And uh, I will also say, as a first-time speaker at NDC London, I thank the organizers for letting me speak here. It's been an honor. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have plenty of time for questions, if, if you have any.